Well, good morning. I am so glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. One thing I would ask of you is to keep Sandra in your prayers. She has had a pretty negative reaction to our last chemo treatment. So if you'd keep her in your prayers, I would appreciate that. It's nothing like having family, especially at times when you need someone to lean on. And we just sang a song about Jesus and leaning on him. We are continuing our study in the uh, book of 1 Peter. And today we're going to look at where Peter tells us we've been called for a purpose. And as we're going through this little uh, letter that Peter's writing to these, he calls the scattered, those who have been dispersed because of Christ. They're strangers uh, in their own land in some cases. But now he comes to a point where he says, let's talk about purpose for a minute. And I really think when you look at purpose of our lives, I think the best time to really see if I have fulfilled my purpose in life is when I come to the end of life. When you come close to the end of your life, when I come close to the end of my life, what what do you want to say and be able to say about the life you lived? I want to be able to say that my life was good. I think that's what most of us would want to say. But one of the things I've experienced both as a preacher and when I was an elder in the church in Lubbock is that I had many opportunities and I took I took those opportunities to visit with people who were in their last days, who were sick and some were dying. I have a lot of memories about a lot of people who have looked back on their lives during that time. <clears throat> and some had a lot to rejoice about and some did not. There were a lot of people who would at best just say life for them was dull. And others who were people who would describe their lives as full of turmoil or anxiety. Have you ever heard the expression, the good life? What does that mean when you hear that Let's live the good life. Well, Peter says if you want to live the good life, if you want to have good days, there's a formula here to follow. Several years ago, you may remember a TV commercial of some men fishing in a boat, and they were fishing and drinking beer. And one of them makes the statement, life doesn't get any better than this. I think, brethren, we can do a lot better in this life than that. In fact, God says we can do better and have a better life than that. And we can live better than that. And Peter is going to tell us that if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to have to follow Jesus as aliens and strangers in this world. And even at that, he says, life can be good. And he says... In his text this morning that we read, he says, To see good days, there's some things we must do. And the first one he mentions is we don't just endure life in order to see good days. He said if we would love life and see good days. But the issue is, that we must understand as disciples of Jesus Christ as we don't define good days the way the world does. People of the world, and this world is full of people who say that living the good life as our culture defines it is one thing, but actually it leads to misery. Remember Solomon's writings, especially Ecclesiastes, 
Solomon had some things to say about what the world says is good life, and he tried it. He said in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, Whatever my eyes wanted, I did not keep away from them. I did not keep my heart from anything that was pleasing, for my heart was pleased with all my work. This was my reward for all my work. Then I thought about all my hands had done and the work I had done. I saw that it was all for nothing. It was like trying to catch the wind and there was nothing to get for it under the sun. Now the world says he should have had a good life. So much for chasing after meaningless activities to find meaning without God. And what conclusion did Solomon come to? He said in verse 17, I hated life. Why? Well, he continues, For the work which had been done under the sun brought sorrow to me because everything is for nothing. It's like trying to catch the wind. I hated what came from all my work which I had done under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Does it sound like Solomon had the formula to lead and live the good life? I wonder how many people today could say the same thing in Solomon who have discovered the same truth as Solomon discovered. How many people today could say there was not a toy I could not afford. There was not a pleasure I could not obtain. I had it all and I could do it all so I did. And as they look back, I wonder if they hated every day of it. Because it leaves the empty. It's, it, it, as Solomon says, it's meaningless. Been there, done that. And what's the end result? I'm going to die and someone else who doesn't even love me is going to get it. They didn't work for it. They didn't sacrifice for it. I'm just going to endure life, I guess. And I guess in enduring life, misery will be my company. That's what Solomon found out. Peter is saying, if you're going to live the good life, don't just endure it. Well, then what do we do, Peter? Peter is saying, if you want to see good days and live life, you must love life. You must love it. He has already told them that their suffering for Jesus was part of the life of a person who follows Christ. And these per people certainly were suffering because of their following Christ. He has told them that following Jesus would in fact make them aliens and strangers in the world, and they were. He told them that living as strangers in this world they were to live submissive lives. And you remember last week's lesson when we talked about that. He told them, if you're going to live life and you're going to love life, he's saying you got to uh, uh, be submissive to the governing authorities. You've got to be submissive to your boss. You've got to live the life that will be submissive even to your spouse if you want to live and love life. And they already knew about this submission, which stems ultimately from their submission to Christ. And this was what brought about trials in their lives that unbelievers don't have to endure. So Peter knows that they needed some encouragement. And the problem is, if you see that how they were treated, how in the world could these people have or experience good life? Well, Peter says you can. You see, there is a false gospel going around today. And this false gospel says something like, if you will follow Jesus, he will fix all your problems. If you follow Jesus, everybody will like you. If you follow Jesus, you will have money anytime you need it. And if you follow Jesus, 
Jesus will make sure that you will be healed of any and all ailments that may attack you. Now, there is a Greek word for that gospel, baloney. It's a lie. But I also have heard this teaching, and it's just as much a lie. And that is, if you follow Jesus, if you are a true disciple of Christ and a faithful member of the church, then you're going to be grim. You are going to forsake all pleasure. You are going to forsake all enjoyment. And if you win the prize of being the most miserable and dour person in the church, you just might be good enough to squeak in to heaven. Now that is just as much a lie as the other one. It is amazing to me how many Christians think that's what it means to follow Jesus. Brethren, I believe that when we come together, we are supposed to enjoy being with one another and having a good time in fellowship. I believe that's part of what coming together is about. I have the feeling that some have brought into the lie that if I'm enjoying church, I must be irreverent. Brethren, Peter is saying, love life. Love it. Love your life in the church. Jesus said in John 10, 10 that he came to give us life and give us to us to the fullest. That means we don't have to be dour or sour. And it doesn't mean that Jesus is going to just fix everything that goes wrong in this world. But somewhere in between is the truth. The world is going to hate us. There will be some who will love us. But we do not operate and we do not choose what to believe based on how the world treats us, whether it's good or bad. These people have been following Jesus and they have been suffering because of it. And Peter said you can still have the good life and you can love life. So how can we live the life in such a way that Peter's calling us to, the full life that Jesus died to give us, how can we live that life so when we come to the end, we can look back and say, it was a good life. Peter tells us to have good life. We must first of all love the church. He said in verse 8, finally, all of you, not some, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, Love one another, be compassionate and humble. This is what Peter's calling us to. If you want to love life, if you want to have good days, you're going to have to enter into a loving and compassionate, Christ-centered relationship with the church. The one another that Peter is talking about here is the one he's addressing in this letter. He's addressing Christians, people who make up the church. One of the temptations that we face, especially in light of bad news and bad things of this world, is to become isolated and insulated from one another and just care only about self. That is a temptation that is very strong and Satan will use against us. Brethren, I've got to tell you something. All I have to do this evening is turn on the, 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 the evening news, and I'm going to be exposed to more bad things than I can fix in five lifetimes. And the effect will be, I will become so depressed and so angry that I'm tempted to become a hermit and just shut out the whole world, including the church, and take care of only self. Is that what Christ has called us to? Is that what Peter is telling us we need to do if we're going to have the full life? 
Jesus comes along and he says, the surest way, the surest way to waste your life is to spend your life in trying to save it. But then he tells us, the surest way to save your life is to lose it by serving God and people. Both Peter and Jesus are saying the same things. Don't let selfishness consume your life. Now, why is this so important? These Christians that Peter's writing to have paid a high price. They have endured a lot of bad things. And the temptation would be to just quit. Just quit. Live for self. Forget the rest of you. Forget everything. If you want to be able to look back on your life, though, Peter says, and know that it was a good life, then don't spend your life building a temple to worship yourself in. You serve and love others. Notice the five things that Peter mentioned in verse 5. Harmony. Sympathy. Love. Compassion. And humility. Those five things are rooted in the grace and in the love of God. And Peter is saying, since God has extended those things to you, to live the good life and to love life is to extend those things to others. Which brings us to the second point that Peter is going to point out is when you experience the good life by loving the church, that's only half of the formula. The second half of the formula, he says, is you must love all people. Notice verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessings, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. Just like in the days of Peter and the days of Jesus, we live in a time that says, and in a culture that says, get even. As a matter of fact, we live in a culture that thrives on not blessings, but cursing our enemies. Peter's saying if you want to get even with people, you really want to get even with somebody, here's what Peter says, bless them. Bless them. Jesus said in Luke 6, 27, 28, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. According to Jesus and according to Peter, if we do that and, be, and we're living like that, we will love living like that. Now, how does it work? Well, first of all, this keeps you from getting, uh, having bitterness consume your life. I have known some people, and maybe you have too, so consumed with bitterness and hatred for something that happened so long ago that they don't love life. Every day, they will spend, and every day we spend in resentment, bitterness, and hate, is a day we have wasted. If there ever existed a group of people who were unjustly and harshly treated, it was those that Peter was writing to. What they had experienced was very unfair. It was unjust and it was unwarranted. Yet Peter is saying to those very people, if you want to love life, if you want to have a life, then you go out and you bless those who have been cruel and mean to you.
Let me tell you the consequences if we don't do that. You will never be able to love life and see good days. You've got to love people. You've got to love the church and you've got to love people, all people, and bless them. So the question is, what must I do to live the good life? First of all, you need to be a sweet talker. Peter said in verse 10, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. James said something similar to that in James 1.26 when he said, Those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. I don't know about you, but as I look back on my life, especially the many things I wish I could do over, do you know most of those things started with my tongue? Has it ever happened to you? It starts with a confrontation, and then you walk away, and you spend the next five hours thinking of all the things you wish you'd have said to put them in their place. You notice how well I did that? When I think about it, am I thinking about the brash things that I could have said or the blessings I could have said? Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You want to live a good life. Be a sweet talker. Secondly, to live a good life, be a good doer. Peter said in verse 11, They must turn from evil and do good. Brethren, discipleship is more than just avoiding doing wrong things. We have been called to do more than just not being known for the things we don't do. God has called us to be active in goodness. Remember Hebrews 10, 24, as he approaches the verse talking about how we, when we come together, some things we do. In verse 24, he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. In Titus 2, verses 11 through 15, listen carefully. For the grace of God that has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify Him uh, for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The Bible does not say, if you marry the right person, you will have a full life. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not say, if you have a big house, you will have a full life. The Bible does not say, if you have the right job, you will have a full life. The Bible does not say if you have all the money you want, you will have a full life. The Bible says, if, or the Bible does not say if you have children, you'll have a full life. You'll have a busy one. The Bible says you'll have a full life if you learn to do good things for others. That's what the Bible says. That's what Peter's telling us. Thirdly, 
Peter tells us that to live the good life, we must be a peacemaker. He said in verse 11, seek peace and pursue it. I don't know about you, but I get amused every time I hear about somebody getting charged with disturbing the peace. You know why? Because I don't see much peace. I don't see a lot of peace in the lives of the people around me that are not in the body of Christ. I don't see it in their homes. I don't see it at their work. I don't see it at their family reunions. How can you disturb what is missing? There's no peace between races. There's no peace between nations. There's no peace between people. I believe it would be very hard to find many people in this world who really understand what peace is. What most people think of as peace is nothing more than just a truce. In other words, I won't shoot you if you won't shoot me. And that's just about the best people can do. Brethren, we have been called to do more than just stop the fighting. We have been called to start the healing and bring peace, the peace of, peace of God. Peter says, seek peace and pursue it. Don't spend your life trying to get payback. Don't spend your life constantly looking back all the time. He says, seek peace and pursue it. So he says, and Jesus says, if they slap you, seek peace. If they treat you unfairly, seek peace. If they lie about you, seek peace. Why? Why? Because, brethren, if they never see what peace looks like, they will never desire it. Remember when the world is trying to turn your world upside down. Remember this. For the eyes of the Lord are upon all, on all, are on are the righteous and his ears are attentive to the prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God sees all of it, brethren. And God's going to take care of it. He sees what's happening to you. He saw what was happening to the early church. But also he sees our response to those things. And if my response is anything other than glorifying Him, if my response is, I'm going to get payback, I have robbed myself of a blessing from God. But if I extend God's peace to those who would do me harm, God is glorified above all. And he knows, he knows if you're doing that for the right reason, because of your understanding of his heart and his will for your life, he also knows this because you will know it. The reason you're reacting the way you're reacting is because at one time you too stood as an enemy of God. Instead of seeking payback, God extended His grace and mercy to you. And now He expects us to do the same for others. What better way to glorify God? One day a preacher spent the first half of his day in a meeting talking about a lot of church stuff. Then he spent a few hours studying for his sermon, then he spent a few more hours writing his sermon. That was his day. On his way home from the office, he noticed a young mother who was stranded on the side of the road with her children. 
He quickly turned his car around, and after visiting with her for a few moments, he found out that she had run out of gas. It was obvious that she was very poor and only had a few dollars with her. So he took a gas can, and he drove to the nearest gas station, and he filled up the can. He took it back to the car and filled, put the gas in the car, and then told her to follow him to the gas station, and she did, and he filled up her car. Knowing she didn't have the money to pay him back, she asked for his address so that she could send him the money, and he said no. He said, you don't owe anything to me. This is a gift from God. Later that evening, as he lay in his bed reviewing all that he had done that day, he thought to himself, you know, the meeting with the church staff was good. The time that I spent in study of the Word of God and writing my sermon was good. But I have concluded that the most meaningful thing I did today was bless a young mother because Jesus had taught me to love all and do good to all. Do you want to love life and have good days? Then let's do what we've been called to do. We've been called to honor Christ by blessing others. Where does it start? It starts with submission. Have you submitted yourself to Christ? Do you need to be baptized this morning to allow Christ to wash away all your sins? Have you been infused with Christ through His Holy Spirit that you receive at baptism? Are you living the kind of life He's calling you to? If you need to be baptized this morning, everything's ready. We're just waiting on your response. If you need the prayers of this church, if we can help you in any way with your walk with God, would you come as together we stand and sing for your encouragement?